the problem with fixing type therapies, which is the problem of all goal orientated activity, is that it only would only work in a literal world, and this isn't a literal world. It's a world that we can understand literally, but which is not itself in any way literal or concrete. And this is a very simple statement to make. And it's definitely one that we don't really have much time for. We tend to think of it as being pointlessly philosophical to discuss the absolute reality of things and the absolute reality of the world that we take for granted. That kind of seems stupid in comparison to the to the heroic um, goal orientated behaviour of which we are so fond. After all, it's much there's much more kudos in being able to do the thing against all the odds to succeed in obtaining the prize then there is in questioning whether the prize is real and whether the goal actually exists outside of our head it's definitely not um, encouraged to be questioning in that way and the reason f we can say that the reason for that is because all literal or concrete realities are games i.e we agree that we will look at things this way and then if you're playing a game the compulsion is to not question the game because playing the game equals not questioning the game So it becomes very, very uncool within the context of the game to start getting, to start becoming philosophical. Philosophy is a box over there. All the other things are boxes somewhere else. So for example, psychology and therapy, they're all boxes over there. They've got nothing to do with philosophy. They used to. They used to be, for example, the existentialist philosophers and the existentialist psychotherapists in there, both coming from the same place. But that's not really how things are now. Now it's all boxes. Our desire to believe in a literal world is purely due to our clinging. We want the security of having a literal world, of having literal things that we can relate to in a straightforward, no-nonsense way. So because of our clinginess, we create the literal, the literally understood world. And that's what we do. We always, always, always create the literally understood world because we want something to grab hold onto. It's like going up the stairs, we want a railing to hold onto. If the world wasn't literal, there'd be no railing. There'd be no stairs either, and there'd be no one going up it, so the whole thing just dissolves. But when it comes to um, therapies that are supposed to resolve um, whatever mental um, problems we have going for us, this literal mindedness does harm rather than good because what helps us is to backtrack. So our first in instinct, our, our urge to rush forward is to create the literal world for ourselves. We don't think about it, we just do it. Getting deeper into that stuff doesn't help. What does help is backtracking and backtracking doesn't happen by reflex it doesn't happen by clicking your fingers or pressing a button or doing the thing it's not a goal we're after it's not the we can't make being non-literal into a goal 
so it's difficult to backtrack and it's backtracking is a process that it's very very hard to talk about or map it essentially involves letting go of all those things that we assume to be true so it essentially involves going back to the drawing board So fixing isn't that at all. Fixing is going forward into an increased realm of literalism. And the thing that happens when we use fixing therapies is that we reify our concepts, we reify our assumptions. So what that means is that when we look forward in terms of solutions, we confirm the problem as being a genuine bona fide problem. We confirm whatever issue it was that was tormenting us as being a real issue that needs to be solved, absolutely needs to be fixed. So then this puts us in this kind of dynamic where we're fleeing from a literally understood problem towards a literally understood goal. And our sense of how well we're doing in this dynamic depends on how much we're able to believe that we're going to reach this literally understood goal. So the whole thing is kind of um, a nonsense, really, because in no way does it have anything to do with reality. Reality has nothing to do with our reification, with the reifications of our assumptions or the reification of our concepts and making them unquestionable so that we can then do all sorts of things on behalf of them or from the standpoint of them. So when we try to fix or defend ourselves or promote ourselves or obtain goals which is the same as promoting ourselves, when we try to do that Instantaneously and in a flash, we create this idea of ourselves that needs to be fixed, that needs to be promoted, that needs to be maintained or defended. And then all the attention's on the fixing, the promoting, the defending, the maintaining, etc., etc. And none of it is on this reified assumption. So at that point, we're in unconscious mode. We're playing a game that we don't know to be a game. The game is how things would be if the reified concept weren't a reified concept, but was actually a bona fide reality. So we can play that game. Say, so, okay, well, let's just say that this arbitrary idea I have of myself is absolutely, fundamentally, irrevocably who I am. And then see what life is like acting as if this is true. So the philosophical bit in that is the as if. So once we've entered into that game, we forget all about the as if. We never, that's a relativizing phrase, as if. Instead of as if, we have is. So on the one hand, we can say fixing is good. Correcting is good. Achieving the goal is good. And we can clap our hands and throw our hats in the air or whatever crap. But what we have succeeded in doing is making ourselves remarkably dumb, really. Super dumb. Because the other way of looking at what we've just embarked upon is that we've embarked upon a pointless game, as I've already said. So what we've actually done is say that I am this without knowing that we have said that, but we're saying I am this um, arbitrary construct stroke idea of myself. And from that point on, I've shut the door on questioning that. There's no way we can get involved in fixing or maintaining or um, defending without closing the door. It has to be slammed really tightly shut really tightly shut. And then everything that happens is all about how well we do in this game. Will I be able to fix yourself? 
can I be able to live on the basis of this self in a way that is fulfilling and rewarding and all the rest of it. But as with all games, it goes around in circles because the whole thing about can I fix the self is, in a manner of speaking, I can go in a direction where it might seem to me for a while that I am indeed fixing the self or consolidating the self. But then because, and we can't really ever get away from this, that self isn't real. We're never going to get far in that direction because we have to come back to base again at some point. So we come back to base again. And the furthest extremity of my journey in the direction of thinking that I'm getting somewhere is the euphoric phase of the cycle. And then coming back again to discover that this glorious idea of the fixed self in all its glory fades away from me and disappears and instead of that instead of that glorious um, mirage that I see before me it's a different landscape and I see I see the the, the damaged self the not functioning self the contaminated or impaired self the self that is not all shiny and new, but the tarnished self, the self that doesn't seem to work properly or that doesn't feel good. It's not buoyant, it's not full of itself, it's kind of jinxed. So this, these two views of the self and I kind of circle around between them in an illusory journey because neither of those views of the self, the fixed self or the unfixed self, are real. So that's what I end up doing. I end up involving myself in that particular circle again, which is the circle that we always involve ourselves in. If you were to cut to the cut to the chase, what we're really trying to do in terms of goal oriented activity is by successfully obtaining the goal and you can imagine all the trumpets blowing when that happens, banners waving. I get to make the self be real. That's what it all comes down to. I might think that the goal is about the goal and the goal is an external value. And when I attain it, that's going to be re really, really good for um, real reasons, authentic reasons, genuinely useful reasons. But that's not it at all. What I'm really trying to do is trying to make this arbitrary idea of myself which has nothing to do with who I am at all be real and that's the magic chasing goals is the magic to make that happen or as we could also say fixing problems is the magic by which I make that happen So we adulate chasing goals and fixing problems, solutions, finding solutions, solution focused therapy and all of that. We love it because the implication, the unspoken implication is that this is how the self becomes real, becomes unquestionable. This is how the fantasy becomes non-fantasy, how to make your fantasies become non-fantasy how to make your dream become more than just a dream. So that's all pretty futile stuff. And what we're talking about when we're talking about all this fixing, controlling, maintaining, promoting is simply, is simply controlling. So everything comes down to the observation that when we start controlling, we reify a false self and we reify the world of that false self's fortunes, whether it's going to do well or do badly. Which is a very unsatisfying um, world to get caught up in. 
And all of that comes about because of controlling. Controlling has two phases to it, as I just said. Apparently successful controlling. Ultimately, there's no such thing as successful controlling, but apparently successful controlling gives the hit of euphoria, like cocaine or heroin or whatever. It's like a, a, a super hit for the ego, for the ego construct. We feel bouncy, we feel great, we feel able for anything. We feel that we're a natural, effective agent that is operating in the world independently and we're having it. They're having our own ideas and then realizing those ideas, etc., etc., etc. And then the reverse phase is where we're controlling just as hard, but then the note of desperation has crept in now because even though we're controlling, things are slipping. Things are slipping in the bad direction. So this is um, controlling that knows itself to be not working, i.e., dysphoric controlling. And you'd think that when we're firmly embarked on this, second half of the loop, the dysphoric controlling loop that we think, oh God, it's not worth it. Pack it in because it's not getting me anywhere anyway. But we don't. Because what we don't tend to understand is that the first phase, euphorically or pleasurably striving from the goal, is an unfree one. It's a compulsion. We are, we are operated by an external compulsion that makes us walk moving our arms and legs and making us walk in that particular direction. We don't know it because we think we want the, to get the pleasurable um, goal. So we don't think, oh, I'm not going to do this, generally speaking. We think, this is what I want. And because that phase of the loop is compulsive, completely unfree, so is the other loop, fighting to save ourselves even when we, we realize that we can't and that our fighting or struggling isn't working. That's compulsive as well. Ask anyone who's anxious, can you stop being anxious? Can you stop striving for the goal that you've started to realize that you can't attain? And of course they'll say no. It's not possible. We've bought into it with the pleasurable striving, the euphoric controlling, and now we're reaping the other side of the coin, which is compulsive or unfree, failed controlling, dysphoric controlling. So that whole territory, that's all there is in it. All there is in the territory is un, unfree stuff, compulsive stuff. So we're, we're a puppet the whole way. And no matter what starting off point we choose, no matter what idea of myself I might choose, it's always the same circle, and that circle is always, always, always the same. There's nothing um, at all different between any circle or any loop that exists for any defined point or defined self that we choose to identify with. The defined point or the defined identity is that loop, and that loop is the same as in every single case. Sometimes the loop might take longer. Sometimes it goes around quickly, sometimes it goes around slowly, but it's the same in either extent, in either case. So it's very clear that controlling isn't going to be the answer, not when it's the false self that we're dealing with. How could anyone say that controlling is the answer? Who is controlling and for what, on whose behalf? We have to look at the blind spot of controlling. The blind spot is who's doing it? And the answer is nobody's doing it. It's doing itself. It's a compulsive loop. So really, really, really controlling always assumes a self. It always assumes a fixed basis. It has to, otherwise it can't control. There has to be someone who is controlling, or if we suppose it in terms of a game, there has to be someone who's playing the game and there has to be someone who wins the game, otherwise the game's no good. So in controlling, there has to be a controller. That's one reification. And there has to be a successful resolution of the control, which is another reification. So how many times? I, I, there's no point in me keep on saying it, but controlling is not the answer. When 
it comes to um, mental health, when it comes to um, the distressing mental health conditions, our gut instinct is to control. And people all around us will tell us to control, but controlling is not the answer. The answer is deconstructing. The answer is going back to the drop not going further into the ever more increasing reification, literalization. So if you wanted to tell someone how to go further into deeper literalism and concretism, all you would have to say is control, just keep on controlling. Or trying to control, it makes no difference. Trying to control has the same effect. And if you wanted to say something about how to go back the way, you could say, Stop controlling. Give it up. Give up your old controlling. See what happens then. Of course, you're much too frightened to do that. But that's the um, that's the only way to freedom. Psychologically speaking, I'm not talking about controlling in all as all these aspects. I'm only talking psychologically because controlling is needed in day to day life. We control the cars we drive so that we don't smash into oncoming traffic. So that's good. I thoroughly recommend controlling the car whenever you're driving. So don't don't um, misread that. But what I don't recommend is controlling when you're suffering from anxiety or anxiety or, or depression or any of the mental health conditions. because controlling is how we create a false or illusory existence for ourselves, psychologically speaking. When we stop controlling, then reality can begin. Reality can come back only, only, only when we stop controlling. Controlling can't make reality come back. Not controlling makes Reality come back. So the question is, how do we, how do we do that? How do we stop controlling? 